Good morning. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us this Easter morning and just let you know that we miss you. We wish you were here, especially in this nice men's class. Uh, we're going to miss all the banter of the men and the back and forth. And so, but we'll try to get through this and looking at a camera and, and hope everything will go just fine. So I wanted to start off this morning before we get into the lesson with a prayer. If we would all bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you regardless of where we are. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for what Easter symbolizes. We thank you for living in our hearts. We thank you for, for making a way for us so that we can spend eternity with you in heaven. We thank you again. We ask you to, to heal our nation. Please be with our nation. Please, please protect everybody as they're watching this at home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, if I were to ask a hundred people, or just, just look at each other wherever you are and, and think about this for a second, what do you think is the most important prayer that Jesus prayed while he was on the earth? Some people would say it's the Lord's Prayer, and that's, that was a very important prayer, true. Some people would say it's Lazarus' prayer, the, the prayer that he used to raise Lazarus from the dead. Some people might say it was the prayer that he made over Jerusalem as he entered, or the three prayers he made while he was at the cross. But this morning, um, I want to take a little bit of time and, and look at the, the prayer that I feel is probably the most important prayer that Jesus prayed, and that was his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you've got your Bibles with us this morning, we're going to jump around a little bit. So it kind of reminds me of when I was a, a youth in a Baptist church. You know, we had these sword drills. So get your sword ready. We're going, to, we're going to jump around a little bit. We're going to start this morning with Hebrews 5, verse 7. <clears throat> Who in the days of his flesh, we had, <clears throat> excuse me, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Next, we're going to look at Matthew. I'm going to read all these verses before we actually get into the, into the, into the, to talking about them. The next scripture is going to be Matthew 26, verse 39 through 42. We're going to start at verse 39, and it says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and said unto Peter, What well, could you not watch with me for an hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. The next scripture is in Mark. Mark 14, verse 36 through 39. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me, nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and said unto Peter, Sleepest thou, couldst thou not watch one hour? Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is ready, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed and spake the same words. Now we're going to look at Luke chapter 22. Verse 41 through 44. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat were as if it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now we're going to skip over to Philippians, chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. And our last passage, I promise this is the last one, is Isaiah, chapter 53, verse 10 and 11. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul, 
and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall, for he shall bear their iniquities. You know, as we think about this, we think about, think about that Thursday. I know you're watching it on Sunday, but it's Thursday here where I am today. And, you know, in, in Jesus' time, that Thursday night was, was really a, a pack full of all sorts of activities. Uh, lots of teaching. In John chapter 13, it's through John 13 through 17, we know that he taught a lot of things to the disciples, gave them a lot of instructions. There was also foot washing, where you had the greatest of all reaching down and washing the feet of the least. There was also the establishment of the Institute of the Lord's Supper and the pivotal departure of Judas as he left to do his task. After these were completed, Jesus, uh, he and the other eleven left and went to the Garden of Gethsemane. If, you, if you've read much about the Garden of Gethsemane, it's about a third of an acre sized piece of property, and it's a place of comfort. Jesus liked to relax there. He liked to go there with his disciples. It was a quiet place that he could, he could pray and, and just feel nature. It was also located along the normal route that was from the temple to the Mount of Olives. The word Gethsemane in Hebrew means oil press. And in, in the garden, as we said earlier, Jesus prayed the, the, what I think is the greatest prayer that he had while he was on earth. When this was going on, Jesus knew, he knew what he was facing. He knew the pain that was coming. He knew the separation he was facing. And he knew that in the balance hang the salvation of, of all the world. Um, after reading our first scripture, you might ask, well, you know, why did you reach back and, and grab something out of Hebrews? This, and how does that relate to the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, let's think about that just a little bit. If we look at Hebrews 5, 7 again, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Everything in Jesus' life was done with a purpose. It was done to teach, or it was done as a symbol to us. And this garden prayer is really no different. When we were in Israel back in September, we went to a, 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 a place where they press olive oil. Our God was real careful to explain to us that there was a real close correlation to the pressing of olives and Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it really was touching because to extract oil, it's pressed three times. The first pressing breaks the olives down, and it gets you get from that you get what's called the virgin olive oil, the best. It was the oil that was used for lighting the lamps in the temple. It was used for anointing. It was the best oil. When they had gotten all of that oil, they would add more weight. They would put the olives into a, into a sack or a bag and add weight onto the wheel, and it would press it even more. The second pressing was just common oil that was used for cooking, lamp, lighting lamps, medicinal purposes, and things like that. When that was finished, they would add even more weight. And that, after that weight was, was put on, they would get the final pressing. And that was lye. Lye came out of the, out of the olives. And that was used for, for cleaning, for washing, for making soaps. And isn't it interesting how Jesus prayed three times, and after all the pressure, it was also cleaning for us as well. He was able to prepare for us a way to, to wash us clean. He, it takes a lot of pressure to produce cleaning. And this is an example of that with what Jesus went through. Nothing in Jesus' experience comes closer um, to a description of the loud cries in the garden that we talked about just a minute ago than the prayers in Gethsemane. You know, Jesus was in agony when he prayed. And he was in such agony that he had great drops of blood that this fell as sweat, like sweat. He was under a lot of pressure, a lot of agony. Um, he had the pressure or the weight of every person's sins that had been born or that would be born. And I was looking on the internet just out of curiosity to see that's if we look at the time from the time Jesus was, was, was born 
until today, there's been about 108 billion people that have inhabited this world. So think about carrying the weight of the sins of 108 billion people. I, mean, I try to think about just the weights of my sins and the things that I've done and I've been forgiven for. And I think we should all each look, look introspectfully and see about the things that we have done and think about our sins. And then think about Jesus having the load of all that put on his shoulders. But interestingly, I, I looked up too, there is actually a medical condition called hermatidocerous. It's a very rare, but it's a real medical condition. And it's where one sweat will contain blood. Apparently the sweat glands are surrounded by tiny blood vessels and these vessels can constrict and dilate to a point where they will actually rupture and blood will infuse into the sweat glands and will come out as blood, just like we were talking about here with Jesus. And this only causes ex extreme anguish. So if we look, what, what was the content of Jesus' prayers and supplications? Um, we know that he prayed remove this cup from me and we know that he was heard in reverence Hebrews teaches us precisely that that with his reverence he was heard but was the cup removed from him no it wasn't was it he, he suffered the fullness and the of physical pain and designed wrath so if we look at his first prayer both Matthew and Mark portray Jesus as praying three different times and each time they went back and found Peter, James, and John asleep. And I wonder what would happen. Would that happen to us today? If, 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 if we were left alone for a few minutes, would we be napping instead of would we be watching? I think today we nap a lot when we should probably be watching a bit more than we do. Luke, on the other hand, gives a singular summary description of Jesus' prayers that includes a detail that, that is not mentioned by any of the other writers and that's the visitation of the angel Luke wrote that he withdrew from them about a stone's throw knelt down and prayed saying father if you're willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but yours be done and then there appeared an angel to him what do you think the angel was there for do you think the angel was there to take the cup away from him no the angel was there to strengthen him the angel was there to, that was God's way of saying, I'm not going to remove this from you, but I'm going to send you a comfort. I'm going to make it possible. I'm going to strengthen it. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to make this possible for you to endure this. Because we've got to all remember, Jesus was, he was in a man's body. He was in a body just like ours. And he knew what he was going to have to go through. He knew that he was going to be beaten. He knew that, he knew that he was going to be scourged. He was going to have a really, really difficult time, almost to death. And he was afraid that he might, in fact, not be able to carry through with it. So God sent the angel to strengthen him, to make sure that, that he, was, he was strong enough. He would not remove the cup, but he would make it so that he could actually endure it. According to Matthew, when Jesus went back to pray the second time, <clears throat> he didn't say the identical words as the first time. The first time, remember in our scripture, he said, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. The second time, he said, My Father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, your will be done. So having the angel there to comfort him, to strengthen him, kind of gives us insight that at that point he knew after the after the first prayer he knew that he had that cup that he was going to have to drink the cup he was going to have to continue and go through with it um, mark also said and again he went away and prayed saying the same words but we don't need to think as that as a contradiction because the words simply refer to your will be done that was the main theme of, of the prayer that Jesus prayed when he was in the garden, is your will be done. But did Jesus go on praying, let this cup pass from me? He did not go on praying, saying, let this cup pass from me. And he knew, again, of the agony that he was going to be facing. But that led him to probably his greatest act of obedience. 
You know, remember, if we go back to our Hebrews 5 again, <clears throat> it said, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of the reverence. Jesus didn't just go on praying to have the cup pass from him. He went on praying for success to drink it, to deal with it. He also knew that carrying it out would require more strength than he has. And he also knows that his prayers were answered. Paul says in Philippians, Therefore God was highly, exalt, highly exalted him. The therefore reserves to, re, refers to Jesus' unwavering obedience to death. Being found in human form, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on the cross. And I know we've all studied the Bible enough to know that the death on the cross was a, it was a terrible thing. It was an embarrassing thing. It was so bad that Roman citizens were not allowed to be crucified. It just didn't happen. It was reserved for, for thieves, for crooks, for the worst of the worst. And so Jesus was, he had the willingness to humble himself enough to take that load for us on that terrible way to die. If Jesus had not been obedient to death, he would have been swallowed up by death forever. There would have been no resurrection, no salvation for us, and the future would not be filled with the glory of God's love and mercy. He prayed this to, to him who was able to save him from death because he knew God had the ability, his father had the ability to save him from death. He knew that. But because of his his reference, his obedience, God didn't have to. He was willing to go, go through with it. So Jesus did succeed. There's salvation for all who believe. Every hope of the gospel succeeds because of Jesus' earnest prayer and because of his anguish and because of his fervors. By the time Jesus was finished praying in Gethsemane, everything was clear. Everybody knew what was going to happen. The lamb would be the reward for his suffering. Out of the anguish of his soul, he would see and be satisfied. Surely this is why we can say, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. The angel came, strengthened him, clarified everything, and gave him the strength and power that he needs to, needed to go through with saving the rest of the world. And you know that exists today. That's there for us all today. That same love, I know we think today that we're enduring some terrible hardships. We're, we're going through some really tough times. And, and we're going through some uncomfortable times. But we need to all remember, especially on this Easter Sunday, that God's in command. God knows, and if you've read your Bible, you've read the playbook, so we know what's going to happen at the end. So I'd encourage you to continue in your prayer life. I would encourage you to, to don't lose your faith. Dig into your faith. We've all got more time to do at home now, things that we've never had to do before. So I'd encourage you to, to dig into the Bible, spend time with Jesus, because He's there, He's there to save us, and He's there to take care of us. So I'm going to close with prayer. Uh, if everybody would pray, please close your eyes. Lord, we thank you again for this day. We thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you for, for Jesus, for his willingness and his obedience on the cross. And we thank you for his, the anguish that he went through and his ability to take that, to take all of our sins and to, and to carry them and to make a way for us so that we can live for, with you forever in heaven. We thank you again for for everything you've done for us. We ask you again for healing on our nation, both physically and politically. And we ask you again to, to be with those who are not saved, that they may come to the knowledge of your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much.